Hey, I'm Jeff Sutherland. I'm here with Scott Downey to talk w about Scrum metrics for hyperproductive teams. I'm the chairman of the Scrum Training Institute and the CEO of Scrum Incorporated. We do a lot of training and coaching of Agile teams. Uh, I was one of the signers of the Agile Manifesto in 2001 and helped get the Agile Alliance started. I was the head Agile coach for MySpace where we had about 68 teams and so it was a really good laboratory to go test a lot of different systems and see what works. One of the things that of course came out of that was uh, the paper that Jeff and I did together which was the shock therapy paper. I also have been teaching CSMs with Jeff for about the last three years. One of the things we've discovered is that teams that start to do well they're like sports teams. They need to be constantly working on improvement, constantly working on getting better. It's pretty hard to stay the same without falling back. I was in Zurich uh, recently and a CEO of a, of a scrum company said, you know, high performing teams are really like uh, fighter aircraft. Jeff, you used to be a fighter pilot. Uh, those aircraft have computers in them that are constantly adjusting the flight of the airplane. And if those computers fail, the airplane will spin in. It's the same way with high productive teams. As they boot up, they have fine adjustments, uh, removing impediments, and constantly adjusting. As soon as they stop to do that, stop doing that, they tend to go off the rails. So we're going to talk today about goals for hyperproductive metrics, how to, how to come up with some simple, the simplest possible metrics. It has unique characteristics in that uh, some of the metrics actually are comparable across teams uh, in contrast with velocity and certain other things which are not comparable. So it gives a way to detect which teams are, uh, need some help in order to do better. Uh, it's interesting, as Scott has really worked on this at, at MySpace, we found that we need to tune up the Scrum meetings a little bit, just subtly adjust the flow of those meetings to get the team really work together. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about how the meetings work. We're gonna then go through the metrics, there, there are eight of them, uh, how they work, what their purpose is. And uh, at the end, Scott has a really cool thing to show you called RoboCoach, an Excel spreadsheet that will actually go through all the metrics and automatically write you a retrospective for the team for the sprint. That's really neat. So the goal of this presentation is to develop a set of minimally invasive metrics that will help scrum masters actually coach and guide the teams uh, by providing them with really a significant deep insight into how the team is working. And to provide uh, six out of the eight metrics we want to talk about, uh, most of them are automatically collected by answering a few simple questions. Uh, six of those metrics allow cross-team comparisons to judge which teams need some help uh, to do better. The whole key to driving these high performance team has to do with working with the invest mnemonic on how good is your product backlog. We've done a minor tweak to the I and invest. In order for a backlog item to come into the team, it needs to be immediately actionable. We used to say independent, but that's not enough. Something can be in independent and still not clear enough for some to execute immediately. So immediately actionable is the I and invest. Uh, the next thing, of course, is negotiable. The stories are usually the means that uh, agile teams build backlog these days and the stories need to be discussed with the product owner and the team. That discussion brings clarity and also options for better implementation, for a better product built faster. The value mnemonic is really important. One of the things we found, we're here at OpenView Investment Partners doing this filming and I've worked with, the, with OpenView over the years and what they've found is that a lot of stuff will sneak into the backlog that doesn't have value. And unless you're constantly questioning that value, you wind up doing things that don't have anything to show, the users don't need it. Uh, we know that on the average worldwide, 65% of features that are built are never or rarely used. And even here at OpenView, we found that about 30% of the backlog is really questionable and needs to be fine-tuned before we go into implementation. One of the things that I really press my teams for when it comes to value 
is when they're digesting the work down into pieces that can be taken into a sprint. I don't want my teams taking in something that the end user won't immediately see as value by the end of the sprint. So in other words, you don't pull in the design this sprint and the coding next sprint. It has to go soup to nuts each and every sprint. So value is not only do we understand the value from the, pers the customer's perspective, but also can we provide value to the customer by the end of the sprint. The E in the invest mnemonic is estimable. Scott is going to go through the way they estimate. The backlog item needs to be sized properly to come into the sprint. We actually have a way to measure the risk of bringing a backlog into the sprint depending on size. So the teams actually have hard data to make that decision about whether a backlog item is too big. And finally, uh, the T in invest is for things need to be testable. In the practice that we're talking about for hyperproductive teams, no story that does not meet that invest criteria is allowed into the sprint. If it is, it will disrupt the function of the hyperproductive team.